this event that happened during the journeys of uh, of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts and this speech that he gives that we've just uh, that Brother George just read for us um, when he's in Athens in the middle of Mars Hill and he's speaking to all of these um, very um, learned people uh, who were asking uh, to hear something new and he tells them of the unknown God who they worshipped and explains who the God of the Bible is. We're going to for a few moments consider the ideas that Paul brings out in these uh, in these verses in his speech and how they re still um, should resonate with us in this day and age and give us lessons about what God is like, what his plan is um, with the earth, as Brother George said in his prayer, and what plan, uh, what what part of that plan uh, we can have. So, just a bit of a background to how how we ended up in in Acts chapter seventeen. Uh, the book of Acts is um, really in, in in several different sections. It details the events immediately after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it's the works, it's the acts of the apostles, uh, the followers of Jesus in establishing the early Christian church. What began with preaching to large crowds in Jerusalem in uh, chapters two and three, it spread throughout Judea, which is modern day Israel, and across most of the, uh, the eastern and central Mediterranean within a very short space of time. The first eight chapters of Acts follow the apostles Peter, John, James, and then Stephen, before we're introduced to Paul, who was a prominent Jew from the Jewish sect of the Pharisees. Now, Paul terrorised and persecuted the early church. That is, until he received a vision on the road to Damascus, and he was converted personally by Jesus, becoming an apostle. After such time, he preached vehemently the gospel of God. And following this, he embarks on a series of journeys, the missionary journeys of Paul around the Mediterranean. Initially, uh, it was concentrated on what is now um, modern day Turkey and Greece, and eventually uh, leading to his, his journey to Rome. These were the missionary journeys. The first began in Antioch in Acts 13. It took in Cyprus and cities in Lycia and Sicilia where he returned. The second journey was more extensive. It took in Western Turkey, then known as Asia Minor, and into Macedonia and Greece. It's in the city of Berea in Acts chapter 17, which is our, our chapter for this evening, uh, this afternoon, uh, but at verse 10, we read that they were in, uh, Paul and his companions were in a place called Berea. Uh, verse 10 of Acts 17, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica heard that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Paul then on this journey with his companions, Silas and Timothy, is in Berea. Paul goes down to Athens on his own to avoid the persecution that was coming up from the Jews at Berea. And so he arrived, he's sent away from the city for his own safety due to the rioting and the disturbance that they cause against the Christians. And he arrives at Athens in verse 16 and waits for his companions there. We read in verse 16, now when, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Athens at this, uh, at this time was a great centre of learning. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a, a, a map of New Testament Athens. Um, it was a great centre of great learning. It's full of Greek universities, uh, places of learning. There were a myriad of very impressive temples 
to Greek gods and goddesses. You can see some of them on there, the Temple of Zeus, the Theatre of Dionysus, uh, the Temple of Hephaestus, and all sorts of other, other places that were and can still be found uh, to, to this day in, in the ruins. The most prominent and famous was and is the temple dedicated to the goddess god I'll start that again. The most prominent and famous was and is the temple dedicated to the goddess Athena, which was the Parthenon on the Acropolis of Athens. It can be seen towering above the city to uh, to this day, and it, it is quite prominent uh, and clear <coughs> uh, that, that you can see uh, from miles around. So that it was dedicated to the goddess Athena, from which uh, Athens took its name. Athena was supposedly one of 12 Olympians, Greek deities who traditionally lived on Mount Olympus in Greece. And during his stay in Athens, Paul, as he often did in the cities that he visited, reasoned in very public places with both Jews and Gentiles, with believers and non-believers. He doesn't tell us in verse 17 what he reasoned about. If we go back to verses one uh, and one to three of this chapter, we find out what Paul's message always was consistently in each of these places. Uh, Acts 17, verse one. Now, when they had passed Thessalonica, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. This was the message of the gospel. This was the message that Paul preached, the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus, who having died though he was innocent, as testified by the Old Testament, had risen from the dead and that he was the saviour, the one who was to bring uh, to bring salvation to the world. And this was the, the, the scriptures that uh, Paul says, it reasoned with them from the, from the scriptures. This was the Old Testament, which they had, they had access to. And Paul taught and defended the gospel daily in the public forums. In this, in this case, in Athens, it was in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. And the marketplace was the Agora. Now, the Agora, Agora or Agori, uh, the marketplaces, they were centres of public life. They were the they were the, the if you like the high street of the of the of the town or city. But more than that, they were the focus of, of public life. That's where everyone gathered, that's where everyone met. The major events, well, they happened in in the Agora, but it was a place of of meeting, of socializing. And in the case of Athens, a great place of learning. You see in um, uh, verse, verse 18, he reads, Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Paul meets these two groups of people in the, the Agora there, the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans were a group of people who thought that the gods had nothing to do with mankind and that the greatest good that could be found on earth was pleasure. And that, that, that pleasure was found especially by gaining knowledge of the workings of the world. That led to their curiosity about all of these new things. The Stoics, on the other hand, uh, believed that virtue was the highest good based on knowledge. And virtue was in harmony with, with fate and providence, all very untangible things. And these came together to form the divine reason. These groups were confused about the God that Paul taught of, of this man Jesus and the miracle of resurrection. Luke, the writer of, of Acts, comments on that social scene at Athens that they enjoyed more than anything, the knowledge of something new. 
Here then was a great opportunity presented to Paul to give a speech for all these very intellectual and learned people. And they took him to Mars Hill, the Areopagus in the middle of Athens. This is a, a rocky outcrop, which, although lower than the, uh, the Acropolis, gave views over the entire city. You can see the, the Agora in the centre of the, uh, the screen here, and indeed the centre of the city. It's the passing place, it's the way through for everyone to access the Acropolis, and it was the centre of public life. So he's at this rocky outcrop. There's a, an artist's impression from the Agora, and you can see uh, the, this, this section up here is Mars Hill. And this was a perfect place to stand up, to be seen and be heard. And it's still a great viewing point for uh, the city and the sites on the Acropolis. So what then was Paul's message? In verse 22, he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and even considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So Paul had seen that they were very, uh, very religious. And you could see they were thinking, well, yes, yes, we are. They were quite proud of the fact that they had been noticed, noted just how religious they were. And Paul had encountered this altar as in his wanderings around the city that said to the unknown God. There is, in fact, a, 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 a stone with an inscription. Uh, this one is in the British Museum that says, uh, is an altar to an unknown god. So the idea of the unknown god is actually, um, to my mind, reminiscent of the tombs of the unknown unknown soldier, prominent in many world cities, most famously in Westminster Abbey, beneath the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, and in the Arlington Cemetery in Washington. The idea of the tomb of the unknown soldier is the remembrance of those anonymously killed in war who were never identified. The Athenian inscription was a related idea, that of the unknown god. You see, even with their myriad of gods and goddesses, the Greeks worshipped this unknown god, almost as a failsafe in case they'd accidentally missed the worship of a particular god house, unless they provoked provoke that god to anger in their... The Greek inscription, or the Greek name for this, would have been agnostos theos the source of our word agnostic. This then Paul saw as a gap in their knowledge which could be filled by a new knowledge of the one true God. He says in verse 23, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. We have then God introduced here. Not a God, but the God, the God who made the world, the physical planet and everything in it. First verses of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Jesus refers to this in Mark 13, verse 19. In Isaiah 40, verse 28, we read, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. The Greeks had a God for everything, a God of the sea, a God of the earth, of heaven, of the air, of water, of peace. The God preached by Paul is one God, and only one, therefore supreme. It's completely opposite to the Greek model of worship and quite different to what society here and now believe. It would have been quite a shock for the Athenians to hear these words, that he does not dwell in temples made with hands, because it was the pride of the city, those temples which were scattered throughout, very prominent, very great buildings, and they're still standing to this day. You can go to Athens and see them now, the great majesty or you could say, the, the ruined uh, glory that they have. He does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor, verse 25, is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth, 
and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So we're made from one blood, or we are made from one. Again, this is contrary to many views we encounter today. But it is the clear teaching of the ban, uh, clear teaching of the Bible that we are all descended from one man. That mankind is descended from one Adam, whom God created in the Garden of Eden. Paul believed it. Jesus believed it, and the Bible teaches it consistently all the way through. That God created the world and everything in it, and that mankind is descended and shares the same character as Adam. In Genesis one verse twenty eight, then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 1 Corinthians 15, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. We read, we read as well in the end of verse 26 about God having determined their pre-appointed times. This goes against the, the, the beliefs of the Stoics. If you remember, I said they, they believed in fate and providence. That's interesting. They, they believed in these things of fate and providence, that things would happen if they were, I suppose, would, would happen if they were meant to happen, essentially. Um, it's those, those kind of things. But here we say... Here we see that God has determined pre-appointed times and boundaries. That's what God has set in place. Now, the Epicureans, uh, they believed that God, the gods had nothing to do uh, with mankind. But here we see, uh, here we see God being invo directly involved in, the, in, in the, the world, in the creation of the world and the sustaining of it. He's developing a relationship with mankind for those who would seek him. Because in verse 27, we read, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us. So let's think of that idea in fullness. God has made from one blood, so we've all descended from one. God has made every nation of man to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that, in order, that they should seek the Lord. So man has been created for a purpose. This isn't a God who has created the world and left the world to it. Man has been created for a, for a purpose. And that purpose is so that they should seek the Lord. Now, that offer is there, but it, it, it is not something that is, that is forced upon mankind. The hope in verse 27 is that they should seek the Lord. It is up to man to make that decision to serve God, to seek him, to learn more about him and to worship him. The decision has been placed entirely in the hands of individual men and women. For in him, verse 28, we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So Paul uses the, 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 these ideas that the Athenians were used to, the things that they'd learned previously and, under, and understood of their everyday things, the things they'd heard around them. And he uses these things to point them to God, to point them to the one and only true God and his relationship with us. You see, out of all living things created by God, man is different. The Genesis record of creation separates the creation of the beasts of the field on the sixth day with the creation of man on the same day. Man is described as being created in the image of God and the angels. And why have we been created in this way? Why alone out of all of the creatures of this earth? Is it physical characteristics? When God, when God's servant Moses asked to meet with God, in Exodus 34 and see his face, God responds by passing his glory in front of Mo before Moses. And God reveals himself in the characteristics of verses six to seven. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, 
keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. These are all descriptions of, of character. They're all descriptions of attribute. This is the name of God revealed, and they are attributes. Man has been created not as the animals who are blissfully ignorant, with no ability to worship or even understand the principles of God and the character of God. We've been created as beings who could choose to worship God, to have a relationship with him, to understand him, or, or, or to understand more about him, so that he is not unknown to us, but rather known. And that's verse 27 of Acts, uh, Acts 17. Mankind should seek the Lord to find him. God is everywhere and to be found in everything. He is omnipresent. It is up to man to seek the Lord, to make the move and respond to the calling and the offer to have a knowledge of God. Our response then comes in verse 20, verses 29 and 30. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent. The onus then is on the reader or the listener. Therefore, in verse 29, the first word, because of these things, it's such an important word, because of all that Paul has said, because of all that God has done for us in creating and sustaining us, what should our response be? Well, the response is in verse 29, we should, ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stones, and it's shaped by art, art and man's devising. This is talking about idol worship, things which are worshipped in place of God, all items that proclaim to be God but have no power in this world. That's the command for us, to put away those things in our lives which have no place, uh, uh, which proclaim to be uh, like God's but have no power in this world, ultimately. And in verse 30, we read, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. In the King James Version, that phrase is winked at. It's the same idea that, that gives us the English phrase of turn a blind eye to. These are times of ignorance. And true ignorance is having a complete lack of knowledge. But you can also be willingly ignorant. If you come please to uh, Romans chapter 1. And we'll go in at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonour their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So these, this is talking about those who can see, can clearly see the attributes of God in the world around them. Those who can see the glory of creation, but in verse 22 and verse 23, professed to be wise, became become fools and turned the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. These are false, turning God into false gods, ideas based on men's thinking. Verses 24 and especially verse 25, we start to get into the idea of humanism and humanistic thinking. These are those who are willingly ignorant of uh, the, 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 the things of God, willingly ignorant of the glory of God that is shown 
in the great majesty of creation. And we are not ignorant. We are not ignorant because we have the word of God in front of us. We read from it. And therefore, we do not have that ignorance. We are instead commanded to repent, to turn ourselves around toward God again and to worship him as the true creator, the one God. The reason for this is comes in verse 31, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this all by raising him from the dead. Psalm 9, verse 6 to 8. O enemy, destructions have finished forever, and you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in, un, in uprightness. So God will judge the, uh, judge the world in righteousness. And how will he do it? It says in verse 31, by the man whom he has ordained. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, we read, Paul says, I charge you therefore before, the, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So the, the judge of this world, God will deliver judgment through his son, the Lord Jesus. Jesus, who is the man who God has ordained. This won't be an unfair judgment, but it will be a righteous one. And Jesus will then rule in justice and righteousness. The certainty of this has been shown by God in that Jesus rose from the dead. If you come with me, please, into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. These are words of Paul. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Jesus had been raised from the dead, and the evidence for that was shown in Paul's day, as all of those people that are listed there, all of these different individuals, groups, and even Paul himself, who had witnessed Jesus alive after his resurrection from the dead. Paul talks in this chapter all about the resurrection. Just read a few verses from verse, uh, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, and he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, and he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who puts all things under him is accepted. Now, when all these things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That's the hope that we are given, that as Jesus is risen from the dead, he's the first fruit of those who, uh, who have fallen asleep. He, he, he is the first one of those who have died to have been raised from the dead. And through him, others will be raised from the dead to the kingdom of God. That is the great hope. And that is the conclusion of Paul's words. This great hope for the future. But the reaction he received was mixed. We read in verse 32 of Acts 17. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Many mocked and rejected the words. Others wanted to hear more, perhaps, but at a later date, whenever was convenient for them. 
But there were those few who were eager to expand their knowledge of God and to repent for that day of righteous judgment was now made known to them. And thus they chose to act. What then of our response in these days? Through God's word, the Bible left for us, we have great hope of salvation and open access to a knowledge of God and for us to have a relationship with him. So which group of responders are we in? Are we the ones that dismiss the message as unpalatable? Are we the ones who put off the matter, possibly never to have the opportunity again or before it is too late? Are we the ones who respond, who thus and therefore act and get to know the one true God, his son, the Lord Jesus, and the blessings which he has prepared for those who know and love him? And a final thought, how can we know God? Well, if you come with me, please, to our final passage in the book of Proverbs and chapter two. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice and preserves the way of his saint. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. So it's up to us then to incline our ear to, um, to wisdom, to understanding, to read the word of God, to gain knowledge of God so that he is not unknown, but that he is known, the one true God in our lives, the creator of this world and the one who brings salvation. Thank you very much for listening.